Welcome back, Autobots, Decepticons, and everything in between to another episode of Theory Misses Transformers Tribune. And in today's episode, we got someone really special on. His name is Sean Stevenson, and he was a 3D modeler for Transformers Dark of the Moon. He's most famous for modeling the traitorous Sentinel Prime, as well as the Autobot Record Top Spin. Mr. Stevenson, I'm proud to have you on the show. Oh, my pleasure. How's it going, man? Oh, it's doing great. Uh, like I said be earlier, I really appreciate you, uh, you know, getting uh, my call back because I, I don't get that many. So it's, oh, no, you. my pleasure. Happy to help. So <clears throat> I guess a great way to kick this off is um, how did you get involved with the production of Transformers 3? Good question. Um, so I've been working at ILM for a little while. Uh, I, I've been actually, ILM was my first job in film, in VFX. Uh, before that, I'd worked in video games for many years, which you can maybe touch on. Um, and uh, I was actually working at LucasArts, um, the very famous video game company uh, owned by George Lucas. Um, we'd been working on The Force Unleashed. That was the last project I worked on there, which is a Star Wars game. Mm -hmm. um, production on that wrapped, and then we were actually working on kind of a, a top secret project for George himself. Uh, and that had been in pre-production for quite a long time. Um, and then we went through what, in, in hindsight, turned out to be the first of many sets of layoffs at LucasArts in, in the sort of build up to the Disney buyout. Okay. Um, so I was on a project and uh, all of, um, pretty much all of my team got laid off unexpectedly. So it was oh. one, one horrendous day where HR came into our room and started just taking people out and we never saw them again it was like really weird um and at the end of it there was myself and the producer left that was it we were the only people who were kept on and i said to the producer you know what do we do now and he said i don't know um i had some friends in ilm and uh, i said you know they were literally in the floor above us and i said can i can i talk to them and, and he said yeah no problem so i went and talked to them and i got taken on at ilm and i'd actually worked on a few projects before so typically working in, I think in film in general, but certainly at that time at ILM is all contract. Mm -hmm. uh, so you work, you know, for a show typically, which could be six weeks, six months, you know, it, it depends on the on the number of shots and various sure. other things. So I'd worked on a couple of projects before uh, Transformers um, and I was, you know, happy to be kept on uh, after the previous show wrapped. Um, and that's what I was moved on to. And honestly, it was kind of baptism by fire a little bit for me because I'd never really done any character based stuff that's not really my area of expertise um, but they had belief in me and uh, and yeah I came on board and didn't see it all the way to the end but again that's based on contracts um, but I was there for I'm not sure how long I was on the project for it could have been about four or five months maybe more maybe a little bit more okay well that seems it's pretty awesome you know at least uh, you didn't get laid off that's horrible yeah yeah, there's a lot of it in the games industry. So, I guess once you finally got involved with the production of mm. kind of what what was the first thing you were tasked with working on? Uh, the first two things that I did actually were um, because I think at the time when I joined, it's gone back a long time, so memory's a little fuzzy. But I believe oh, no we didn't have full concept for any of the new Transformers. Oh, um, really? You know, typically how it works is you know we we're essentially work for hire, right? So we're a we're a visual effects shop that bid on the on the show and on certain sets, not certain shots, sorry, and then concept and everything comes from the actual movie house, right? From Universal or Paramount, whoever it might be. Um, so I think we were waiting for final concept. So we knew we needed some updates to some of the models from the previous shows. Um, so I actually was given um, fairly small updates, honestly, for the most part, compared to making something brand new. Um, I was given the task of updating uh, Optimus, um, and Bumblebee. So that was the first two things I did, uh, just really to get into the sort of the language of Transformers and you know how the how the parts looked and and learning the tools. There were some very specific tools for that production. Um, so that was the first two things I did with some updates. That's awesome. Now I know when it came to Optimus and Bumblebee because I know the main changes for them like with Optimus, he got like these new forearm pieces, and the main thing was like this new abdomen section. I was yeah. always wondering. Was there a reason why they decided to give them those abs, or is that just like a design choice? I, I design choice, I think. I wish I knew. Um, you know, typically it's uh, it's very compartmentalized in VFX, so we're typically just given, you know, here's the concept, here's the changes, off you go, run with it. And because we're, you know, the visual effects are, again, they have to bid on the show, right? So everything is is um, 
it's very tightly controlled as far as budget's concerned. So we don't have the luxury like we do in games where we can just sort of experiment with things and ask questions. We, we typically blast on through there. So I had very little time to do those things. So I wasn't given any specific explanation, honestly. But uh, I was given some... For those two, I think I was given sketches, but not really solid concept art, um, if I remember rightly. Uh, yeah, I, I was working with the art director a little bit on that. Yeah. Because there is this image of Optimus with it, but it's not like that ILM render. And Bumblebee mm. had the same thing. So I assume it was kind of the same thing when he got that new yeah. uh, chest piece. And I believe parts on his back were like... The back was the specific of what I remember. I not, a little, I'm getting a little fuzzy on everything I did, but I definitely clearly remember doing the stuff on the back on Bumblebee. Yeah, because sure. they got his... Because he became a new Camaro when he had like this spoiler and then yeah. replaced the light bar that was on the that's back. Right. So that was, that's one of my that favorite his designs for him. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So I did, I did work on that, um, and the chest it was changed a little bit on Optimus. And I can't remember exactly, but I do remember changing the chest and the yeah, the abs. You reminded me about that. That's that's absolutely the areas that I was working on. So I so I worked on those two um, while we were waiting for other stuff to come through. So I mean, that, that's awesome. I, I just love you know talking about this because this is information a lot of fans just don't have at all. So sure, it's really yeah. Cool. And and to us, it's just you know, hey, it's just a job. Um, so it's interesting that you guys, it's nice to document it, I guess. It's interesting you guys take so much interest in it. So I know the main thing that, which when I looked at your art station, because this thing mm. came years after, I'm like, oh my God, there's new renders of Sentinel and Topspin. I'm like, holy crap, because <laughs> you don't, you usually do not see that. So I guess I want to move on to Sentinel Prime about, because sure. he's like the big bad, you know, the main mm -hmm. villain, you know. How did you go about modeling him? Like, did you have the concept? Did you kind of right. idea it? Like, how was the process? So the process was interesting. So I'd actually been working on, we'll talk about Top Spin later, but I'd been working on Top Spin first. Um, oh, okay. And then I was actually taken off him to work on Sentinel Prime. I guess it, the concept came through and they needed someone to work on him. And it was, you know, the big, the big guy. Um, so we, all I had initially was, we actually got, um, I can clearly remember seeing a sheet, a one page, which had all of the new robots on it. Uh, but they were, you know, they were small. They were just like what it was a scale chart. Yeah, they were basically thumbnails. It was scale chart, but it was, but it was more like I guess we, I guess whoever was in charge of production had got individual sheets for all of them. Um, but they were, they were very sketchy, okay. and they'd then gone and put them on in one sheet just so we could see all of them. So it was uh, that was the first thing I got to start on. And what we did, and actually this was across the board on all of the new robots, we actually had um, our lead, our visual tech supervisor, went through and made really basic models of all of them right and that was mainly to get just the silhouette and the scale um so he did you know game res old school game i've been working in games since playstation one so this was like playstation two sort of resolution characters you know really just looking at the shapes and the form and the silhouette uh, he did that for all of them um to get a sort of an initial sign off so i got access to that model um, and then I also got a three-quarter shot um, concept, which is a full concept. It, it was literally just, you know, like a three-quarter perspective view um, of him from the front. And he was posed. I remember. I can't remember exactly how he was posed. I do remember he was posed. And he had that sword that he mm -hmm. has sort of standing by him. Um, so I got that. And, and that was it, really. I was still just, just run with this. Now, you know, we, we did build up over the two projects prior kind of a library of pieces you know because we're working on things that come from cars that come from trucks there's a lot of similar bits even if it's just like a bolt we you know there's no point in reinventing the wheel again and again so we did have a library of those things so i started by really fleshing out the big shapes so the big body pieces that were unique to him and to his vehicle and then adding in things like you know pistons and actuators and, and bolts and pipes and all that kind of stuff and some of them were hand built and some of them were taken from the asset library um, and that's really how we fleshed it out. But yeah, the co only concept I had was was the front three quarters. So the back, that's a different story. That was a mystery. Okay. So then, yeah, that's the next question I had. Because on mm. your model specifically mm. of Sentinel's back, he mm. has these awesome four capes. While in the film, yep. he only had two. So right. did, So I, I assume you kind of have to go off of, you know, the silhouette on that? Um, so what happened there was, um, you know, I, I made, I, I, I was... I was allowed sort of free reign to an extent, but remember all this stuff had to go back to the um, actual movie studio um, to get into the director, right, to get sign off. So I remember doing like 
a first pass of like the spine and the ribs and you know the shoulders and all that basic structure but i i was i had no idea how that how that back cape looked i knew there was one but i had no idea about it so we we were also in in ireland we had so we were called the digital model shop so we made the models but we also had a concept team um and they were the art department essentially so i went to the art department and got one of their senior guys to to take a look at my model and then he did some drawers for me and so he actually came up with the the whole notion of the four the four way cape at the back um which i modeled uh the, the reason it changed that was actually after i left i believe so you know again i come back to earlier contract so my contract ran out um you know, you you paid hourly and, and it, it all comes into the budget, right? So that essentially my contract ran out and I actually moved on after Transformers. Um, so I'm guessing, and I don't know this for sure, I'm guessing one of the full-time artists who were there probably took it over and made changes. And my assumption is that just came from feedback from the studio. I see. Well, I, I really like the four cape design more than the yeah, two. Yeah, I thought it looked awesome. kind of cool. It's yeah, so cool. It was interesting. And he's like, yeah, the... it, it has it has a lot more scope for movement, and I think that was kind of partially why the concept guy came up with it as well. Is, uh, you know, one big chunky piece. It, it, you can't really, you know, it doesn't. I guess it's not as open to animation because they're essentially just steel strips, right? Yeah. Um, and if they're in four pieces, you can have a lot more motion there. But so, but yeah, I'm, I'm assuming it just came came back from the director. Well, that's awesome. So, um, oh, this is another question I had with Sentinel. So I don't know if you did this, but I know you modeled his earth mode so when he's like the fire truck based mm. on the tires now in the yeah. movie he has like two more modes he's like on when he's on the moon he has like mm -hmm. it's basically the right, same the start model. of the film right yeah and and yeah. at the end of the film he has all this battle damage on him were you responsible for those as well damage no i don't know who did that honestly i wish i did um you know we had another department called digimat uh, and then we also had a very specific character department so it could have come from either of those uh, digimat tend to do background stuff so it probably wasn't them um, it probably came from, you know, we had some character artists who were, um, we call them creature artists, who were very, very much more into like sculpting, so using ZBrush. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming it came from them, but that certainly wasn't me. Uh, the the moon at the start, I did do some of that. So uh, and I and I remember doing that quite late in the project actually. So I'm I'm assuming it was because because I did all of the the head and everything like very specifically. It's one of the first things I detailed out. So I didn't do like the body, et cetera, for the moon. And I'm not sure it changed very much, honestly. It was the um, same, just the tires yeah, were changed. Just, right. So um, you remember it zooms into the eye and all the pieces start moving around. So I, I did the design for that. So that was one of the things they did on there. And we, we really had, a, again, a fairly sketchy piece of concept. So it was a matter of just making it more interesting, more spiky, and, and lots of layers of movement that we could have going on. So I, I did, again, I'm not sure if it's exactly the same in the movie as what I did, but I definitely did the first pass on that for sure. Well, that's awesome, because that scene is just so cool, because it goes into yeah, his eye it. and then has, like, the title screen. Right. Still, I think that's the best intro they did. Revenge of the yeah, Fallen is really a close nice. second, but that one blew me away. Yeah, it, it is really nice. I liked it when it was animated, because I didn't, I never saw an animated version of that until the movie was out, so that's the first time I saw it. But, yeah, I did all of those kind of rings of detail in there. Well, that's cool, man. Um, yeah. And I guess another uh, thing with Sentinel, now, this is, like, but what people hate him for is when he kills Ironhide, he uses like this yep. cannon, this rust right. gun. Now I know right. in your concepts you show the sword and the shield, but yep. were you also responsible for creating his weapon? No, I don't remember ever where that came from. Um, that one is is a, is a bit of a mystery to me. I did do some weaponry for Transformers, but it wasn't that. Um, so yeah, I don't know where that came from. That could have been it. Could have been another artist. It could have been an outside vendor potentially. Um, or it could have been, you know, just kit bashed together from other pieces, but definitely wasn't me. It I is see. cool, I agree. And this is another question of Sentinel. I don't know if you had a part in this, but early on, like this is in the teaser trailer and some of the mm. old concept arts, he was yellow, but then he became red. Was Did you any know why that happened? No, actually, I don't. Um, I believe that was probably very early because the first concept I got, he was already red. Yeah, so I'm okay. not sure about that one. Yeah. All right, so yep. let's see here. Um, so when it came to Sentinel Prime, um, I guess since he's such a complicated robot, um, uh -huh. you know, what was the most challenging part of doing that? Because you said you, oh. your base wasn't like in creatures. So how did you do that? Yeah, the most complicated part, honestly, was once the first pass had been done, um, because there's a lot of internal structure, not just in him, but maybe more so in him than some of the robots, but especially in him, there's a lot of internal things like just underneath the surface, which you can see in certain animations. Um, so lots of, like I said, 
actuators and pistons and tons of piping and tubing and all that kind of stuff and although the intention with each transformers movie was that it we, we would like to get it to work correctly um you know the reality was the, the models were so complicated and the time was like so limited that really it doesn't and that's kind of why a lot of the transformations are very quick with all the motion play right so you don't see the stuff that doesn't work um so that was but that was a big we tried to get it so at least it was reasonable um mm -hmm. and a lot of the problem is when you are making something that complicated with lots of internal architecture um you have no you, you can sort of take a best guess about how things should be placed relative to each other but you have no idea what's going to happen when a rig we call it a rig right like skeleton is put inside it and it's animated you've got no idea what the animators are going to do or how any of that deformation is going to work so the real challenging part was get that second pass done so how we actually ended up approaching that was i did the first pass model and I sent it off to the rigging team uh, and I worked very closely with one of their tech artists um, and he literally came back to me very quickly actually with a new version of the model with the rig but he had um, I don't know if you know what this means but he'd vertex colored so he, each polygon has, is made of vertices right the little points and you can actually color those vertices which then puts a color onto the model um, so he came back with a vertex colored version of the model which essentially was like a, a like a little key green is good right don't need to touch this geometry blue i seem to remember was like mm, maybe we need to look at this and red was like we have to fix this so you know it was things like a, you know a pipe that would intersect right through an arm piece when it was animated so we needed to work together to figure out where that pipe can go so it'll deform better uh, we did a pass on fixing all the red pieces and then the blue stuff some of it we lived with some we had to tweak a little bit but yeah it was it was really a really useful back and forth between me and the tech artist doing that stuff yeah well that's pretty cool because you know with the being such complicated beasts yeah. um sometimes if you like i watch these films like in premiere frame by frame because i'm just a geek right. i'm you'll sure see, you're gonna see some stuff you just see a little bit of clipping so it, yeah. you don't really notice it unless you like really look so i mean you guys yeah. did a killer job um and i guess with sentinel this is another thing uh because i know you said you talked about his vehicle which mm. is this massive, beautiful airport fire truck that's not FFA yeah. regulated because it's red to be yellow, <laughs> which is the coolest thing. Because like I believe right. in the interview, Bay's like, I don't want it yellow. It doesn't look cool enough, so we need red and black, and it just yeah, looks so I cool. Think, I think red is is the color, right? It's what you associate with like fire engines and things. So, so I, I guess the question is because I know the main part you can see with Sentinel is those uh, those big off road tires and his chest mm. and his legs, mm. and mm. I get his chest is the windows. Like, so was there any part of the truck? that you also incorporated because i assume there's more pieces but it's kind of hard to tell because like a knight right yeah and um i'm trying this is going back a long time i need to look at the model and what i can tell you is we didn't we didn't really get the truck and then take pieces from it right so mm -hmm. um we pretty much made everything from scratch oh, uh, really? we we didn't we didn't really honestly reference the truck very much and again like the the thing about you mentioned michael bay so the thing about michael bay is and I discovered, well, I discovered a lot of things about Michael Bay during this movie. But one of the things I discovered was um, if the model you present him for sign off is not as close to 100% exact to the concept as possible, he'll reject it. Um, and that was why we couldn't really take too much license, it, you know, in terms of taking pieces from a truck or from whatever and putting it in there to make it more authentic because it would have been rejected and i and i've got an example of that from from the um the backpack the jetpack that he that he had that uh, optimus had uh that was a particularly interesting one but yeah no we, we didn't really we didn't really reference the truck at all particularly i see um so i guess that, that scores all my main questions Senol, and that's pretty cool information on the geeks cool. on tfw are gonna love this <laughs> and so, so as my subscribers as well so i guess when it came to topspin but he's like right here i have like a Senol i see him. Topspin figure i love topspin he's so cool he has like the little hair and everything but i, I know guess, it's such a shame he was cut from the movie more or less that's you know? one thing i was yeah. wondering because when you emailed me that i'm like he was cut because i knew he was a background could you okay i guess before we get get to that we should probably go down the list so i guess when it came to topspin was it kind of the same process that it was with sendal yeah, as well it was exactly the same process but uh but earlier on i mentioned that i was working on him and then i was told like hey you know you need to move sentinel so i probably i probably got him to like 
again, this has gone back a long way, but I probably got him to like 70% done. Um, and then, uh, because I was taken off him to it and suddenly was given to another artist who'd been there for a while to finish him off. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, his main structure was, I, I seem to remember what was missing was one of the arms, maybe the left arm. I don't think I'd finished. Um, and maybe a bit of the chest. Yeah. So what I was able to see with the model, the only really main thing I could notice that was different and is going off by memory was mm -hmm. that his arms were there. He just didn't have the guns on his back or on his that arms. And then right. something that really cool uh, that I did see on him is when you did the tires, they seemed as they came mm -hmm. from Bumblebee, but for the film, they change it to like the race NASCAR mm -hmm. things. I'm like, wait a minute. I've seen that. That's so cool. Cause you yeah. never get to see these early Prevez models if right. ever. So that was like really cool to see. So was that something that came from like the Transformers assets library that you used? I believe that probably did. Um, I can't think of any other way. And and I don't remember we had such good concept for him either. So probably then we were kind of given a little bit more license initially until we got the approval. You know, that's, I, I seem to remember that, the, the, you know, the, the reason I switched across to um, Sentinel was because that concept came through. And you know, when you got the concept, you should work with it. Um, so I, I think that's probably why that why that was. Yeah, we probably just used what we had because we didn't know what else it was supposed to be, essentially. All right. So um, I did like I, his hair, though. I thought the idea of him having the the crash net is the hair. That cool. that is the coolest thing. The little yeah. crash net. I love that so much. Yeah. So the so the render I have of him, I don't know if you noticed that it's it's flat. The hair's flat. It's yeah. almost like it it just spins out from it. It's not like. It's not like it doesn't drape like hair. That's because the hair was simulated, right? So we did physics simulation on that. So I made the hair, but one of the tech artists put a, phys a physics simulation. So it flopped and then it kind of hung over his shoulders correctly. That's really cool. He's like only one of the few uh, characters of hair. I think uh, Wheeljack or Q also had it as well. The top spin is just crashing. How does that work when he transforms? I don't know. It just I know, I don't cool. know either, but who cares? It, like, yeah, I, I liked it. I was very sad that he was not in the movie very much because there was some more shots that he was supposed to be in and they were just edited out or cut. Yeah, How, I mean, however, it works on the cutting room floor, right? I don't know. Because that's the new information. Because when you said that, I'm like, he was cut because nobody. Because Topson's one of the less, it's like the background character. It's the same because it's so cool. And I, I'm guessing, I mean, I know it's been like over a decade, but like, can you, yeah. do you remember kind of what was there before, of him before it was gone? I don't. Um, and I wasn't directly working on the shots themselves. You know, that's a different department. So I, <laughs> I mean, I got to see what we call dailies, which, you know, daily renders of, of everything. I don't remember what he, I remember him being in other scenes, but I don't remember which ones. But yeah, like the last time I watched the film, I remember him just sort of, he was more like static, right? He was sort of standing behind Optimus in, in there was a sunlight shot, a sunset shot, I remember he was in, and a couple of other shots, but he definitely had some action scenes. There was definitely more transformation involved, and we didn't really get to see much of it, which is a shame. Yeah, they, I say one of the best designs in Dark of the Moon that there was. Now, yeah. this is a question about him specifically. Mm. I don't know if you know this, but, and it doesn't matter if you don't, but have you seen the fifth film? Because it kind of gets Which one context. is it? Uh, it was the last one Bay did. It was like the Knights. It's, it's not really amongst Bayverse fans. We didn't really I don't like think it. I've seen it. Okay, so this is gonna have a little bit of explanation to it. So we don't see Topspin again in the fourth film, but he comes back in the fifth film. And but for some reason he has a completely different head that was used from a different character. Oh, and weird. the th theory that fans have came up with is that since Topspin did not have a voice actor, his mouth was never rigged to uh, speak. And, we're, right. and that's kind of the theory they came up with, but I was always because since you built that's him, possible. So you that think is that possible, could be? but but it could also be just budgetary. I don't remember who did the visual effects for that for that movie. I, I, I don't think it was ILM. Could be a budgetary thing, uh, you know. That yeah, maybe they had a head that was rigged and they would just fit right on there. Um, I I can't imagine it was anything to do with the voice itself, but. But yeah, it could be that, you know, it, it, making making these models is time consuming, you know, just making the head for uh, Sentinel, for example, probably took me a couple of weeks of solid work. So, you know, if you budget that per hour on with an expensive artist, you know, it, it adds up. Um, and I think that one was a little bit lower budget, that film. I'm, I'm guessing, reading between the lines a little bit. Yeah, because it's, it's weird because they had a completely beautiful head usable. I mean, because right. I know you talked about rigging with Sentinel. I mean... Mm. Like I said, it's over a decade. Like, do you remember specifically if he had a physical rig just to speak? I, I assume he would. Yes. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. Yeah, especially okay. with him because I don't remember but his lips. 
and very segmented they actually made of separate pieces quite a lot of pieces so just to have those moving yeah it has to have a proper facial rig absolutely okay so that's kind yeah, of and even for the eyes you know the eyes that are moving like there's there's a lot of stuff the facial rig is more important in a lot of ways than the body rig it's it's where you look right um so yeah there was there was a lot of work went into that I, i'm not a rigger so i didn't do it but uh but yeah there was there was a full rig for i think for all of the transformers honestly maybe not for top spin uh i'm not that familiar with that one but I'm I'm assuming most of them had a full rig, but yeah, if if it was known that he wasn't going to speak, then I could I can imagine you would take shortcuts there. I see. So then another thing uh, when it comes to a good old top spin here is I guess between him and Sentinel, because of the two main characters you did, mm -hmm. which one did you ha did you like more or you had more fun creating? I had more fun probably with top spin, but I think um, I would say I was more. I got more out of working on Sentinel, uh, and I think mostly because, well, firstly, because it's kind of nice to know that he's in all the major shots. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it, it's good to see you work up there. But um, but I think also I'd kind of at that point got more confident with the tools and the processes because they were the previous movies that I worked on at ILM. You know, we, we have shared or we had shared tools across, you know, the entire studio, but there were some very specific ones for Transformers, so it was kind of a big learning process for me. So by the time I got to work on him, I pretty much knew it inside out. Um, so it actually, it went a lot more smoothly for me, I think. So that's probably a big part of it. And I just like his design anyway. I like fire trucks and all that kind of stuff. So Yeah, <laughs> so cool. Um, so I guess another thing that you're most notably, uh, you know, created was Optimus's jetpack and right. interestingly enough though that design was not the final there's yep. a toy of it that came out which is actually uh -huh. really cool so I guess uh, did you end up creating the final one because a lot of that actually would become in the final model it was just kind of I'd need to look at the uh, I'd need to look at the final the final shot again because I don't remember exactly how it looked but I did a version uh, whether it's the final one or not, I'm not 100% sure. I need to go back and cross-reference. But um, I worked on it for quite a while. Um, so what what went on there was we got some very sketchy concept, which I started working on. Um, and this was a pretty quick turnaround. I, you know, I think Sentinel probably took me, people like to ask, the first first pass from, from start to rigging was probably about six weeks. Um, I think with the jetpack, it was probably two weeks tops. Um, and there's quite a lot of detail on there, even actually, you probably don't see a lot of it in the film. Um, I got a very sketchy concept for that, so I started working on that until we got the final concept. And the final concept was was him actually on the jetpack, kind of flying. Mm -hmm. But I seem to remember we also had a version without him, right? Because you just in Photoshop, you could just hide that layer so we can just see, you know, just the jetpack. Um, and it was like, a, like again, it's over three-quarter view, like slightly above. And we needed to send... Um, renders like for approval to the studio to the director and I can clearly remember sending a, a really nice high deal render of that along with concept art back to Michael Bay and then hearing nothing for, for quite a while um, and then one day one of the production team came around and said to me oh we got some feedback on the jetpack and I said oh yeah how did it go and I think the exact words were he absolutely hates it Oh, really? I'm pretty sure that's the exact words. Sorry, Michael, not putting words in your mouth, but I'm pretty sure that's what I heard. Um, and I said, interesting. Can I get something more constructive? And they said, it doesn't look enough like the concept. And I was like, I think it looks exactly like the concept. Yeah, it honestly. looks pretty close. So we uh, we got together with the, the FX soup and we looked at it and they literally told me, if you haven't posed the, the, the object, the character, whatever it might be, in exactly the same pose as it is in the concept art michael will just reject it and i guess that was the problem that it was i had just done a regular three-quarter render thinking you know you can read between the lines here a little bit what i ended up having to do was put the concept into my 3d package in the maya and literally pose it as best i could obviously the you know concept doesn't have a, a correct camera lens right it's just mm -hmm. done concept art so it's, it's approximate so we had to approximate it with a, a lens that more or less was the right length so it would fit and i put it so it was as, as overlaid as possible and i took a screenshot of that or a render of that and i put them side by side and that was that was the way it got approved it was literally by doing that i didn't do anything to the model at all it was just how it was posed <laughs> that's wild yeah I mean, oh, it's crazy yeah 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 that's what you got to deal with sometimes 
yeah, because because I remember when you said that earlier, I'm like, how does that not look like the concept? It's literally the concept, just a different yeah. angle. Yeah, yeah. But I know another thing that you worked on was um, this, like this gun. And if I recall correctly, this was used by Crowbar and Crankcase in the film. So, uh, kind of, what was the uh, process with that? Because it's such an interesting design. Was that the which one was that? The one with like the tubes and the pipes? Around yes. It? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, again, that was just a three quarter concept, and that was a really sketchy concept I had for that one. And uh, and I I literally just modeled it as best I could and added some of my own stuff to that one. That we got away with a little bit more on the weapons, you know, because they're sort of secondary. You don't see them as much, and they tend to be covered in VFX anyway. Um, so yeah, just process same as modeling anything. Really started out with a with a very low detail block out got the shapes and the silhouette and the form so it looked like it matched the concept as best as possible and then just detailed it out um and that one went i think first pass was just straight through the pipe and done and i didn't see it again if your model doesn't come back to you it's usually a good sign so that one went through and i never saw it again uh, it went through your texture because i was only making models i didn't ilm had a very specific texture department uh, surfacing we call it and also model department so i did the models and i signed to texturing and then it went to rig and it didn't come back so i was okay with that but yeah it was it was very much the same thing just like i say with a little bit less specific concept that's pretty cool and i always wanted to have a figure uh like with that weapon but unfortunately hasbro for some reason never made it they gave them their other weapons which were like these spike bombs that came out of their back but the guns they yep. just never gave them i always wanted yeah that. yeah was this spike bomb the grenade was it like a long yes it was, it was a long thing so i did that as well oh yeah. you did as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. say so, yeah, i did that at the same time as i did the weapon you mentioned yeah i did those both of those and I'm curious if that, um, and I could be wrong on this because I'm basing what I remember from the film. Was that meant to be the light bar on those? I have characters? no idea, actually. I genuinely don't know. I was told it was supposed to be like a grenade or something. I seem to remember, but yeah, it was yeah, a grenade it, in the film. It just like flashed yeah. red and blue, but they were like SUV right. police vehicle. So I assumed, okay, is okay. it also the light bar as well? Like, yeah, they never told me that. Yeah, yeah, we didn't really get as into the lore as I think a lot of people think we do, you know, even on Star Wars where we did a little bit more. Um, it was, you know, I hate saying it's just a job because, you know, there's people out there who do really mundane things which are just jobs. Um, but sometimes when you know you've got like, this got to be done in a week, you just blast on through it. Uh, and yeah, we didn't really, I didn't hear anything about that. So it's quite possible. See, well, that's awesome. I didn't know you did that. So it's cool that yeah. I got brought up. Yeah, um, yeah. So I know another thing that you're credited was the simulations. I know you touched on it a bit. And, and I remember in one of your sizzle wheels, uh, you showed uh, the scene where like the building collapses. Right. Some kind of, could you go kind of explain like what exactly is the simulation part of this? Yeah, so that was the sims are typically done by by a very specific technical artist. Um, and, and these days, mostly is done in a piece of software called Houdini, which some of your viewers might know. Um, I, I believe that we didn't do it in Houdini. I, th I think we could have, but I think it was a little early. So I think we probably did it in, in Maya with our own in-house same tools, which we had. We had a suite of tools for that stuff. So so essentially, I built like the, the skeleton of the, of the big giant building um, in Chicago which is you know the, the structures so is the it's the brick essentially right the walls and then the ground floor and then all of the glass all of the window each, each individual window is a separate model uh, each window surround is a separate model and then each and then out of that stuff with some concrete we built like individual floors and then we could just stack the floors and maybe put some variation in there uh, and then all of that final model which was really heavy it's surprising because it's essentially just a big cube but because of all the little individual bits you know, and then when you shatter things, it becomes very heavy because what, what's essentially just a flat plane for a piece of geometry, for sorry, for glass, becomes a lot more complicated when it's shattered. So, so yeah, we we uh, I sent that model, and there was this quite a bit of back and forth between model and tech art for this process. Um, but I sent that off the sim, and it's essentially you know they'll they'll crack and fracture. There's actually some specific tools called called fracture, um, which will put like an actual fracture through the object and then it'll simulate it sort of collapsing uh, and it's a very lengthy process um there's no rigging involved as such not not usually um i did say i worked on a movie called rango and it the same process for some sims in that um but yeah it's similar as that really is build the model out of lots of individual pieces the tech artist typically wants it presented in a certain way for his sim uh and that's why the glass is separate so it can shatter uh, and then he does the fracture and the shatter and then we review it if I need to tweak the model, I will, and he can just go back and replace it and resame. That's basically the process. Yeah. Yeah, I think that scene was the highlight because you just see it's the driller, like this 
big big old worm just crashing yeah. and stuff falling out. I remember there's like a at least in the special features, they have like five minutes just dedicated to just how they did this and it's just it's insane. I mean Yeah, awesome. I did actually start work on that uh, worm. Um and I think it was again when I was waiting for some other assignment, but uh, I did start working on that because, you know, I was the only guy in ILM at the time who come from a games background, and mm -hmm. that worms are extremely complicated. Um, so they wanted someone to just come in and do like a very low res, like detail free pass just to get the general feel. So I started doing that, making like essentially game res pieces that we could kick bash into that worm, and okay. I did I did just the front bit, um, and then that went off to another artist to turn he he took control of it all uh, once we once we blocked that out i could be wrong on this so i believe with these game res models they might have been used in the previs department potentially potentially so um again i sorry to get off of transformers a little bit but but rango the previous movie i worked on um we did a lot of that there so you you certainly with something like rango which is which is not a visual effects movie right it's an animated feature everything cg um it, it's a lot heavier because because everything's CG, right? There's not an actual backplate. Um, so for that movie and, and several other ones, we do like like animatic res um, models. Uh, so for example, in Rango, the town itself, when you're looking through the town, there's a lot of CG going on in there. And the stuff that's in the background past a certain distance, you really don't need that high res render, right? So mm -hmm. we do what we do in games, which is called LODs, level of detail. So the stuff that's in the background is really, really basic textured models. That's how I started off most of my models in Rango and some of them in, in uh, Transformers as well. And they, they go into pre-production, you're right, because when the animators are animating the characters, they want to see what they're animating to, like buildings or whatever. But they don't care about the detail, right? As long as the form and the volume and the shape's correct, the doorways are correct, for example, they don't care. So it can be as low res as possible. And it's more advantageous to them anyway, because then in the 3D software, it runs at a much better frame rate. Uh, so yes, absolutely. We we would do that because it's, you know, the models are just too heavy to run in real time if you do an animation. Yeah, and I remember, okay, this is not for Dark Moon, but for the previous film, there's this uh -huh. guy he was a pre-visualization supervisor. His name is Steve Yamamoto. And they said that they basically had more runtime of just those animatic shots than the actual films themselves. This that's crazy. an interesting that's an interesting point, yeah. Yeah, and like I say, with Rango, I know for sure we have some of them. So I, I actually I actually did game res models for some of the buildings in Rango that I know for a fact were in the movie. It's hard to pick out because they, you know, like they become background and then you get some depth of field. Um, but, you know, I can clearly remember doing one of the smaller buildings, I think it was a building called Peanuts, Corn and Hair, which is, which is, there's an interesting story behind that. Uh, and I did it like with a single, again, if anybody knows what this means, a single 1K texture, it's just a small texture for the whole building. And I remember some of the artists at ILM saying, how did you do that? And I was confused. I was like, do what? And they said, do all that in one texture. And I was like, I just laughed and said, that's what we do in games. You know, we're used to doing that. So uh, it was an interesting experience taking that background into uh, into working in VFX. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty cool. And I kind of want to touch more on that because, you know, as you said, you were the only uh, person who worked on games before, you know, I guess the only person in the department that did that. So I guess how did that, like, besides with the point of the 1K texture, how did that, like, help with Transformers and, like, with that background? Not the texturing so much, but like you say, you know, example of the worm and things like that, you know, it, it's it just allows us to rapidly prototype things rather than going like straight into doing detail, you know, if you're doing a lot of detail, it just takes a long time, even, even if the shape isn't massively different, you actually have to put in a lot of extra polygons just to support it when it renders, um, because we do this thing called subdivision surfaces, which essentially means that the closer to the camera the model is, the more subdivided it becomes, so therefore the smoother it becomes, right, and you need to actually put a lot of structure into the model to make that work if you're not bothered about that and you really want something that's just functional for the animators or just to do a previous you know don't care about how it looks it's more about the feel um then just being able to rapidly prototype and put things together quickly is super super helpful um so you know did a lot of that um not as much on transformers but you know even going back to when i said at the start there we i didn't but a supervisor put together some very low res block out of everything um that's the sort of thing that we did quite a bit of in rango and some other movies you know literally we don't really care about is is it like geometry perfect is it going to render perfectly we care about how it looks right when it's all put together does the overall silhouette and form feel good uh you can tell a lot by just having just polygons rather than 
the final, the smaller detail. That's pretty cool. And this is an interesting point that you said with the, like when it came to the rendering, um, cause I know with your, and on your art station, you have like these shots of Sentinel and Topspin, which are really cool, but they actually, they have like a completely, they're, they're not a hundred percent fully done, I think with the textures. So was that like just an early version of the texture or like something like that? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't do textures. Like I said earlier, that comes from a different department. So, uh, the stuff that I get is, is typically my, what we call turntable. So that's, um, when we finish a model or even when we're in production and we're looking at it in dailies, cause every day they have a review first thing in the morning. Um, and it doesn't always include your work, you know, it depends how much stuff you've got to review. Um, but you'll typically get called down to the daily suite and you'll sit there with the producer and many other people on the project, sometimes the director, and they'll just play your daily, right? And mm -hmm. take some review notes and then you go back and fix that stuff. And um, the stuff that you would have seen would have been a daily render. So, you know, model is finished or model's 80% finished and we push it through the um, render pipeline. And there's some automated scripts there that will actually render it in a very specific way, which is for dailies. So that'll be the stuff you saw. Um, and it's basic placeholder materials. It's more about the object. And, and the scripts kind of put it into a very formulated lighting rig so that every model, when it comes out, looks the same. You know, if we randomly put in lights in there, then everything's going to look different. Um, so we try to review with the same lighting rig, the same background, which is fairly neutral um, because the constant is about concentrating on the model rather than anything else that's going to confuse the issue, right? Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much what you saw. That's cool, yeah, because I've, I've seen what you meant by that, uh, the lighting, because they actually would use that same shot for several different films. Yes. And a fun fact is that in the fourth film, they have like these playing cards of like the Transformers because mm -hmm. the CIA was after them. So they kind of like right. get the kill cards and they would use that exact same shot. So you could actually yeah. see, because in one of those shots, you see the like Bumblebee's Camaro. So it's funny because there's a thing of Ironhide in the background and you see Bumblebee's Camaro. Uh, okay. like, How does that work? So it's pretty right. funny. Yeah, that'll just come from the render scripts. Yeah, there's there's some of the tech artists uh, basically made those. But, uh, you know, we as artists, so, some of the artists are like more technically minded than others. You know, so some artists will get the technical artists to do that for them and, and other people like I have a tech background. Um, so I would just send those renders myself. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a really nice system. You know, it's super easy in games. It's a lot more manual um, there, you know, in film because they've been doing it for such a very long time. They know what they're doing. They have the tools, they have the pipeline set up. And uh, it was really nice learning all that stuff. It was definitely a change from working in games. You know, in, in a way, a better change, and in a way, not so much. But uh, it is what it is, right? Yeah. So I guess <clears throat> once the film finally came out, mm -hmm. when it came to your work, seeing it mm -hmm. on screen, mm -hmm. I guess what was the thing that blew, that blew you most away? Uh, you know what? I think just seeing, like, final animation. Like, I think animation, especially with character stuff, when, when you're used to watching your character just standing in what we call a rest pose or a T pose, we call it, uh, it you know, it becomes, like very dry um, and you know uninspiring I guess even if you're kind of happy with your model after six weeks of looking at it every day you're sort of done with it but then when you see him actually come to life and you start to see a little bit of that in the dailies when the animations come in but, uh, but seeing the final thing and how it edits together because even seeing those individual daily shots they're cool but you've got no real point of reference about how they fit into the story or the movie so seeing all that stuff together and then obviously with the with the actual effects you know blasts and, and fire and all that kind of stuff which we usually don't get to see because that's compositing is last in the pipeline so by that time we've either left the studio or we've moved on to another project so we typically don't get to see that stuff until it's final unless we really go digging for it um so seeing all that you know like like him fighting him blasting you know any of that stuff was uh, was great it just it makes him feel integrated into the world and uh, that's always a magical process for me you know it's something that you, I've never really got involved with that whole composite side of things, but compositors really bring all of our work to life and make it feel like it's a living, breathing world. So that was really cool. Yeah. And I mean, that's awesome. Cause I, when I see dark of the moon and I compare this to like other projects that have come out, you know, in more recent times, I honestly think it's still, it looks, I'd say better than some of the stuff that you see now. It, it's crazy. It holds up really well. And you know, there's a lot of complaints, isn't there about CG? You know, I've got some friends who hate anything with computer graphics. Um, you know, and, and sometimes I have to agree, there's a lot of really low budget computer graphics stuff out there now. Um, I just, I was watching a trailer earlier on for a movie, I forget what it's called now, uh, Under Paris or something like that it's called. And it's about a killer shark in the sewers in Paris. And I just was thinking, okay, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but it, it, the CG just doesn't look great. And 
I think our CG looked, I could be biased, but I think our CG looked really nice. And that's, you know, partially because ILM is just an awesome company, but, um, you know, I, I do think a lot of CG has moved into other locations, other studios, purely on budget. And that's not always the right decision, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, ILM, when it came to Transformers, probably the best ones that could do it, because there was the most recent one called Transformers Rise of the Beast. It was done by a mm -hmm. different studio. I believe it was MPC. They did oh, a good MPC. job uh, for what they did, but you could tell it just wasn't ILM quality. Yeah, it's interesting in film. Like, I, I always thought it was, it was um, I didn't know how they managed this process at all. I wouldn't have wanted to do it. But a lot of the shots, even, even on Dark Moon, were through different studios, right? So it's not typically not one studio does everything. And sometimes there's like 10 or 15 studios involved and it can be, you know, the frame stores and the NPCs and the mill and, you know, any of those guys can get involved and in some shots. And I, I think that must be a real challenge for the visual effects supervisors to make sure that all of the art from all those different studios using different tools because they don't share the tools, like oh, yeah. feels like it sits together. It's a, it's, it is a challenge. Um, you know, I think I've worked on a couple of feature films where we did all of it, but they were, they were typically the animated feature films rather than visual effects. Yeah, because that, that does jog my memory, because I think Dark of the Moon had, uh, I know Digital Domain was part of it. Right. Um, yeah, I worked at Digital Domain briefly, but um, not on any of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot. Uh, yeah, that there studios. is, there's a lot out there, yeah. Because I think, yeah, for Rise of the Beast, it was, only, it was only just MPC, and I think towards the end, there was another studio that jumped in because they were falling behind with right. production, so it's, it's wild. I mean, I, I'm just... It's an eleven. It's like a thirteen. Yeah, it's a thirteen-year-old film, and it holds it just holds up so well. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's thirteen years has gone quickly. But yeah, it does. It does. I mean, I you know I don't watch most of the stuff I worked on, but you know I I see clips of it here and there, and you know occasionally it's on cable or whatever, and I jump in and look at it, and I and I, I agree. I think it holds up really well. It truly does, and I guess another thing, because uh, I know we kind of went back and forth on this. I don't know if this interview might have helped rejog your memory on some things. I know you said you worked on some other things for Dark of the Moon that you may not remember, like anything that might come to mind. So one thing that does come to mind is there was, a, and I don't remember what we called it now, but there was like a giant, like, um, like a weapons array. Oh, we had. Optimus Prime's trailer, that yeah, circular it, thing. Yeah, that's it. So I worked on the first pass of that, and we had very little concept for that, I remember. Um, and it was a pretty complex model, and a lot of it was really up to me to sort of figure out. I mean, we had the shape, um, mm -hmm. like figure out how it worked. So there was, it was a little bit of a, you know, a head scratcher, honestly. Um, and I did a first pass of most of it. I don't think it was ever finished because I think I was doing that probably around the time I ended up doing the jetpack. Um, I, I have a render of it somewhere, and I, I don't know where I'd have to try to dig it out. But yeah, I worked on that, and I worked on that for a few weeks, and it was actually it was kind of fun because it was. You know, all of it was high pressure because it was sort of given to me to to really figure it out. Um, I enjoyed doing that process a lot. So I did that. Um, I mentioned the grenade thing earlier on. What else did I do? That's probably the bulk of it. I'm sure something else will come to mind. But yeah, that was the one thing that, um, you know, there was a big the big ticket item. Uh, and I don't think that made it into the movie, did it? I don't it, remember. It did. Oh, it, it did? Was, yeah, it was like, a, it's it's such a cool design because Optimus trailer is essentially like a box. Mm. And then it becomes all round. Mm -hmm. And then the jetpack that is on like the top of it of all these right. other weapons. It's such a cool design. That's right. I remember it being on the top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have probably haven't watched that film properly for maybe maybe since 13 years ago. But um, but yeah, I, I, so I did work on that and I know I didn't finish it because I I just, I remember not finishing it. But I got a good way with it. Uh, and so who, who knows what happened to that. But I'm, I'm glad it made it into the film. It did. I mean, it's, it's just crazy. Because how do you turn a box into a circle? It's like it's a wild design. It's the magic of magic of VFX, right? Lots yeah. of motion blur. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and I guess one of the last things I do want to touch upon that you said with the skeletons. Um, mm. How much? Because I because I've seen only very few images of like other robots, and there's like a lot of detail that you actually never get to see in the film. So like, is that more complex to do than the outer shells of the characters? Yes. Now, the outer shells, I think, are the most important bit because they sell the shape and they sell, you know, the idea that it comes from this particular vehicle. Uh, you know, you need recognizable shapes in those big pieces. Otherwise, you know, your brain doesn't connect one to the other, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they, they're important that you spend the most of the time on that because of that reason, because they form the main silhouette. But, you know, Transformers, the whole nature of it, even from the title sequences, everything's moving and transforming, right? And 
And to give things that are big, like, you know, Sentinel or Optimus, that sense of scale, it actually relies on all the small stuff, right? That's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like Star Wars, right? You know, the uh, Star Destroyer. The reason Star Destroyer looks massive is because of all the little tiny greeblies that are all over it, right? They give the, the brain that, that sense of scale and connection. So it's really similar with that. You need to put all those bolts and everything in. Whereas in games, you know, we would, we would never put all the screws and the rivets and stuff in. In Transformers, well, in film in general, you have a much bigger budget for polygons, so you can put that stuff in. And if it's in geometry, it just it sells it better, especially if it's something that can move like a spring that can contract, you know, something as simple as that. So that's really complicated because, you know, you can, it's quite easy just to make like a piston, for example, but then a piston alone is not enough. It needs lots and lots of greeblies around it and extra detail just to sell it as a as a busy moving kind of living organism. Uh, so that that's definitely the most complicated. and. It can be kind of frustrating because it feels like, oh my God, I've been adding stuff for days and days and it really still, it feels empty, you know? Like I remember working on Sentinel's upper arm and I seemed to put in so much work into that and then I would just move the camera a little bit and I could see daylight right through and you don't want to see that. You want to see like a lot of internal structure without that daylight. Um, so just constantly moving things around, adding things, scaling things. It's, it, is, it is time consuming. It's exhausting actually, mentally exhausting. Yeah, I mean... Because I've so because they're not like a basic silhouette. They have all these pieces coming out, and that has to have armor under. I mean, I don't even know how you guys do it. It's insane. And you know, you really need to connect those pieces, even if you're not sure you're going to see them, right? You need to know that that big that big shoulder pad, whatever you want to call it, you know, it has got some connection to it underneath, right? It's bolted in in some way. So if the camera, because most of the time we had no idea where the camera was going to go, so we had to cover all eventualities. And if the camera just looks at the wrong angle, and that piece looks like it's just floating, that's not going to work, right? So then we need to go in there and add that, you know, that little connecting piece, the rivets, the bolts, whatever it needs. Um, so yeah, that was that, that's actually probably the most challenging thing is not knowing your shot, you know, before you actually get to work on it. Yeah, and there's also, like you said, there's a lot of experimentation because you only have a concept to go off of, and then you got to expand that concept while keeping its core DNA. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the the whole process from start to finish is pretty complicated, but you know, it's fun. I, I mean, like I say, I complain about things like that a little bit, but I could be doing a lot worse jobs. So it was it was really enjoyable the whole project, honestly. And then another question, I think you might have answered this already, but I believe the model that took you the most amount of time was Sentinel? Yeah, I think I was like, say, about six weeks, but that was only for the first pass. Okay. Um, you know, and we ended up coming back, like I said, to, to, with the rigging to do quite a bit of, there was probably two weeks of to and fro with the rigging. So I would say it was probably about, about eight weeks, all in all. And then, you know, again, like we mentioned earlier, there was probably some edits done after I left, after my contract ended. I don't know how much. Uh, I think the majority of him looks more or less like I left him, but I'm sure there's some changes that I'm not aware of. Yeah, majority, it looks the same. I Because I first saw him, like, oh, my God, it's a previous render sentinel. We don't have this on file. And this right. came out, I think you uploaded that last year. I'm like, oh, my God, Darker Moon stuff coming out in, like, 2023? What is this? <laughs> it's crazy. I probably got other stuff lying around that I don't know. You know, I, I have CDs full of stuff that, you know, some of it, some of it's probably just the same, but it's just earlier versions, you know, like work in progress versions and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, we, we kind of, we have to sort of be careful. We have to formally request things, you know, you can't really just go and take work. So most of what I got would have been requested from, you know, the, I forget what the, there was a special person, contact person in, in all of the studios they worked at where you can request stuff for your reel, for your short reel. Um, so I'm not sure how much pre, pre final version I would have. I might have some. I need to look around. Yeah. So that, that's an interesting point. So then I guess since it's a contract based, you don't own that. It's the studio who has it and you have to request it if you want to yeah. feature it. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, some it, it's a little looser in games typically, you know, they don't like in a lot of ways in games there's, there's a lot more paranoia um, because games take longer to come out, you know, some games mm -hmm. are like three, four years. Um, so it's a little bit of paranoia about that, you know, they don't want, and I understand it, especially if it's their own IP, they don't want that to get leaked. Um, you know, so one, once it becomes, it's a public domain, right? It's a film that's been released or it's a game that you can buy. It's a little bit easier to get access to that stuff, but when it's still being in production, yeah, it's pretty hard. And so if you're a contractor and you're not there at the end, you know, that just becomes a slightly more complex process. 
I see. Now, this is like the last question I have, and I don't know if you would know mm-hmm. this specifically, but since it's related to Sen, I'm going to ask it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, in the original ending to Dark of the Moon, uh, it's, it's completely different to what happened in the final film. It's actually where Sentinel actually fights off both Optimus and Megatron, and then he eventually dies his own hubris because Optimus shoots the Rust Cannon. He falls apart. But they changed it for some reason. I believe it was due to the Amazon leaks, but I'm curious if any word of why that ending changed ever got to you. No, I knew nothing about that. And, you know, again, maybe I don't remember when that was changed, but that could have been after I left. Uh, I, I doubt it. I guess it was probably... Because I was there fairly close to the end, so it was probably none. Um, but again, that's probably not my department. So like, my models just yeah. went off, and then I think I was even looking at working on another project by by that time, which never came through. I was actually supposed to work on um, oh my goodness, it was an alien film. I forget what the heck it was called now. Uh, anyway, um, I was supposed to work on this other film, and and. It was delayed and delayed and delayed, so I actually ended up moving to Lucas Animation. So I, again, I stayed within the same company, but I worked on an animated feature film there for George. So I think it was probably done after I left at that point, so I wasn't aware of it. No worries. Yeah, it's it's such a mystery, because a lot of fans think the original ending was better, was better than what yeah. we got, because you know, Megatron actually surrenders and teams up with Optimus, which is something you never get to see in these films. Sounds interesting. Yeah, I would like to have seen that. All right, guys. Well, that was our interview with Mr. Sean Stevenson. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, thanks again for coming on to the Tribune. Uh, I know the fans are going to love uh, hearing your story, and I think they're going to really appreciate uh, what you had to say today. Oh, no, my pleasure. It was it was really fun. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, sorry I didn't have much information about some of the questions you asked, but hopefully it was a little bit uh, insightful anyway for everyone. <laughs> this is the first time I'm hearing most of this information. So okay, wonderful. I call it a dub, you know. Nice one. Okay, thanks very much again. Have a good one, Jason. Take care. You too.